Oh, have linking the comfort of the spirit of truth wherever our present fills all things, treasure of good things, and give our life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from all impurity and save our souls, O good one. Amen. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, we're a small crowd gathered to speak about a great feast tonight. Of course, the feast that I'm mentioning is the coming celebration of the great feast known as the Theophany. Uh, Somehow, I think if we reflect a little bit on this, we'll realize that the greatness of this feast is somehow lost upon us sometimes. Usually, I think we would attribute this to the fact that it falls immediately after Christmas, or the Feast of the Nativity. So for, for many people, it takes a diminished importance in light of the celebrations of the Nativity. For example, we all make a great effort to attend the liturgy, to be at some of the extra services uh, during Christmas time. But I wonder, and I wonder aloud for all of us, if we approach the Feast of the Theophany, this great feast, with the same fervency. And I think most of us would have to honestly answer that question in the negative, that we sort of let the Theophany slip into the background uh, when faced with the Feast of the Nativity. So having said this, I think the question that we're going to ask ourselves tonight becomes somewhat obvious. Are we justified, brothers and sisters, in treating the Feast of the Theophany this way, in somehow letting its importance escape our notice uh, because we're tied up in the celebrations of Christmas? Are we justified in taking this position? Now, to help answer this question, I want to read to you a brief passage from one of the hymns that is uh, sung at the Vesper services in the days leading up to the feast. It's from the Apostica uh, of the Four Feast. Well, this is what we chant in the days leading up to the Theophany. Splendid was the feast which is now past, in other words, speaking of the Nativity. But yet more splendid is that which is to come. So splendid is the feast which is now past, but yet more splendid is that feast which is to come. So when comparing the two feasts, the Nativity and the Theophany, our Holy Church actually emphasizes the feast of the Theophany as taking the higher place. And now today, in our little opportunity, the few minutes that we have together, I want us to run briefly over the Gospel passages which are associated uh, with the Eve of the Nativity that we'll read tomorrow morning within the context of the Vesperal Liturgy of St. Basil, and also the Gospel uh, appointed to be read in the Feast of the Theophany itself, as well as looking at a few passages from the Synaxarian and, as always, from the Holy Fathers, in order to help us gain a sense of why the Church holds this position, why it holds that the Theophany is, in fact, even a greater feast than the Feast of the Nativity. So. Let's turn our attentions to the Church's rationale then, the reasons for its ranking this feast so highly. Well, the first reason for the Feast of the Theophany's greatness is expressed a few lines later in the hymn that we've just read. So we started, Splendid was the feast which is now fast, uh, has now passed, but yet more splendid is that which is to come. And here comes the reason the Church gives for this. For the former had an angel as its herald, but this one had the forerunner to prepare it. So the Nativity had an angel announce it. This feast has the forerunner announce it, St. John the Baptist. It's the greater of the two feasts, then, the Church argues, because it's Herald. The one who announces it, it's coming, is St. John the Baptist, who Christ himself, as we all know well, says, among those born of women, there hath not arisen one greater. In other words, there is no one greater than St. John the Baptist. So the Feast of the Theophany was prepared by the greatest of men, while Christmas was announced by the angels. But this might cause some of us to have doubts and to question the Church's logic. Are men indeed greater than the angels? A funny question. According to the Christian teaching, the teaching of our Holy Church and our Holy Tradition, the answer is yes, men are greater than the angels. And listen to how this is explained by our Father among the Saints, uh, or, or rather our Holy and God-bearing Father, 
Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain. This is how St. Nicodemus explains that men are greater than angels. Even when man is compared with the invisible world of the angels, again he is called a great world, while the invisible world is by comparison a small. So man is a great world, the angels are a small world. Man includes in his world both the visible and the invisible, while the angelic world does not include the elements of the visible world. So man is indeed the greater of the two of angels and humankind. Man is the greater because within man is synopsized, is summarized the whole of the created order, both the invisible and the visible world, while the angels only represent one, the invisible world. So indeed, man outranks the angels in this sense. So man is greater than the angels, and so the path to the feast, the fact that the path to the feast was led by the greatest of men, is one of the reasons for the greatness of the theophany. A little bit of a complicated argument, but an important one, and one the church begins to make to us through the hymnography. So, the feast was announced by St. John the Baptist, the holy forerunner. But how did he lay the path for this feast? And this, brothers and sisters, will find is the subject of the gospel, which we'll read uh, tomorrow morning at the Vespera Liturgy of St. Uh, John, of uh, St. Basil, rather. We should remember always, brothers and sisters, that the church and the readings it appoints and the hymns it appoints doesn't do things arbitrary. They set things out in a very deliberate order. And so as we hear, as we'll see in the coming two days, tomorrow morning, the preparation for the feast will be set. And then when we celebrate the Feast of the Theophany, the content of the feast itself will be set before us, just as was the same in the case of the Nativity. On the eve of the Nativity, we heard the prophecies and all the uh, prehistory of the Incarnation. Then on the feast itself, we hear of the Incarnation. Um, so none of the things the Church does with respect to this are arbitrary. It chooses its readings and its hymns very carefully. So tomorrow, what will we read? John, we will be told, came baptizing. And many came out of the great city of Jerusalem in order to receive uh, the baptism of John in the River Jordan. But his baptism, however, the forerunner's baptism, was preparatory in nature. It was symbolic in nature. It symbolized rather than did something. Uh, and it was solely pre to prepare the way for something greater. As St. John himself testifies in the Gospel we read tomorrow, this is what he's going to say. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he who shall baptize, uh, but he shall baptize you rather with the Holy Ghost. So I'm simply baptizing you with water. The one who comes after me will baptize with the Holy Ghost. So St. John himself testifies to the fact that he's doing a preparatory work. Now, the next question. What fearful moment is St. John preparing for? What is he doing this preparation for? Now we have to pay attention to the reading at the Feast of Theophany itself, because it's in this reading that we'll see what fearful moment is being prepared for. Christ himself will indeed come, we will see, seeking baptism at the hands of the forerunner. St. John, upon seeing this fearful sight, immediately is filled with fear and he, above all others, knew that who Christ was when he came to him. For he had left in his mother Elizabeth's womb when the pregnant Theotokos had approached him, as we read in the Gospel according to St. Luke. And so, knowing who Christ is, St. John, the forerunner, immediately shrinks from the request Christ puts to him. And we'll read this uh, brief passage. So Christ comes to John, but John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? Christ rebuts St. John, however, saying, Suffer it to be so for now, and right away, immediately after Christ says this, the forerunner submits. Now the fathers, the Holy Fathers, note a couple things about this resistance and submission. 
that I think we want to take into account or consider. First of all, they call our attention to the quickness of the Baptist submission to Christ. We don't hear any long debate here after Christ uh, retorts or answers to what St. John said. He simply immediately submits and does what Christ asks. Also, this whole scene is a manifestation of true love and obedience. To the holy forerunner, it didn't immediately make sense to baptize Christ. He baptized people, brothers and sisters, into repentance, he tells us, and he knew Christ to be God and with no sins to repent of. And yet, though this request seemed so strange to him, he submitted to it. And things are just precisely the same with us many times in our lives within the church. Sometimes Christ's church asks us to do things that don't seem to immediately make sense to us, even when we try to approach them with the eyes of faith. However, we have to understand that generally, as St. John the Baptist understood Christ to be God and therefore knowing better, knowing truly what he asked, we have to understand the same things that the teaching of Christ is there forwarded by the church, and we need to submit ourselves to the physician quickly and out of love. We must learn to submit to a higher logic than our own, uh, that which is inspired by the Holy Spirit, as did St. John the Baptist. Now, why did Christ ask such a thing of John? He indeed had his reasons. According to Christ, the reason he asked St. John to, baptism, uh, to baptize him rather was that it would fulfill all righteousness. Now, what does it mean to fulfill all righteousness? It means a number of things. First, according to St. John Chrysostom, to fulfill all righteousness means to fulfill the commandments. Since then, we have performed all the rest of the commandments, he says, and this alone remains, it also must be added, because I have come to do away with the curse that is appointed for the regeneration of the law. I must therefore first fulfill it all, and having delivered you from its condemnation, in this way bring it to an end. It becomes me therefore to fulfill the whole law, by the same rule that it becomes me to do away with the curse that is written against you in the law, this being the very purpose of my assuming flesh and coming thither. So fulfilling all righteousness, as St. John Chrysostom tells us in that uh, somewhat difficult passage, is the fulfilling of the old law, which is evidence of sinlessness. Just like a few days ago, a few days ago, as you all well know, we celebrated the Feast of the Circumcision along with uh, the Feast of St. Basil the Great. And a natural question, I think, arises of the celebration of that feast. We say, St. Paul tells us that circumcision and uncircumcision, neither of them avail anything. In other words, it's not very important whether one submits to circumcision or not. And yet, for some reason, we celebrate the feast of the circumcision of Christ, even though the Holy Apostle Paul tells us whether one is circumcised or not circumcised, circumcised, uh, circumcised is of no importance. Why do we celebrate the feast? Because the circumcision of Christ represents a fulfillment of the uh, covenant, which was given to Abraham in Genesis. And so in order for Christ to show himself to the Jews as number one, sinless, and number two, the fulfillment of everything that had been promised, he needed to actually fill out all of the commandments and all of the elements of the prophecy. And this includes the submission uh, to uh, circumcision. Now, fulfilling all righteousness also means, however, the fulfilling of God's purposes. So on the one hand, it means the fulfillment of the prophecies and the uh, commandments. It also means the fulfilling of all God's purposes, the Holy Fathers tell us. And he indeed had other purposes in the case of the theophany. Now, what were God's other purposes? First, it is at his baptism that Christ revealed himself as the Son of God to the whole world. According to the hymn that we all know well, on the Nativity, the Lord became incarnate 
and now in the theophany he cometh forth. So on the one hand, nativity, he's born, in other words, in the theophany, he begins to show himself. To this point in history, St. John Chrysostom says, it might have actually been possible for people to mistake John for the greater of the two if they compared St. John the Baptist and Christ. John was from a priestly family. John was raised in the wilderness and lived in asceticism from his youth. John wore a garment of hair. John openly was calling men to baptism, and John was known to have been born of a barren mother. In contrast to the Holy Forerunner, Christ was of ordinary rank. The virgin birth, the events of the Annunciation and Nativity were not well known. He had lived in society, he grew up within society, conversing with all manner of men, and he wore normal raiment, he wore normal clothing. It would indeed take a great sign that this opinion uh, would not prevail amongst the people. The people were generally, could have easily been inclined to thinking St. John the Baptist the greater. There needed to be a great sign to show them that it was Christ upon whom they needed to focus and not St. John the Baptist. And so a little further in the gospel, This is what we read, the gospel we read in the Theophany. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So the heavens at the baptism of Christ opened to declare Christ's divinity. For the voice of the Father thundered forth from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son. And to make sure that there is no mistaking who the Father's this spoke of, the Holy Spirit descended on Christ in the form of a dove. This is my beloved Son. Nowhere else, this is my beloved Son. So at the Theophany then, at the Lord's baptism, he was shown to be the Son of God to the whole world for the first time clearly. Now, another of God's purposes at the Theophany was to reveal the Trinitarian nature of God, clearly, again, for the first time. As the well-known hymn says, when the Lord was baptized in the River Jordan, the worship of the Trinity was made manifest. For the Son was present, the Father spoke, and the Spirit descended. So we have these two important revelations from a, in a theological sense then. On the one hand, the theophany uh, presents us for the first time with clear certainty that Christ is the Son of God and the Messiah. And also we have the very clear revelation of the Trinitarian nature of God, that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as all three persons act very clearly in that moment. Beyond this, however, there's other purposes. Also with the Theophany, uh, the Lord, through his baptism, shows us that we too ought to be baptized. Because, as we ask ourselves often, is there anything Christ himself did that we can reject putting into practice in our own lives? There's indeed nothing that Christ does that we shouldn't desire to emulate. Not only does it show us that we should be baptized, but it also shows us why we should be baptized. The heavens uh, were opened, you'll remember, showing us that through baptism, the doors to heaven are opened unto us. And the Holy Spirit chose to appear in the form of a dove. Why? Because a dove is a sign dating very uh, back to the flood of the reconciliation between God and man, that the enmity between God and man created by sin was going to be taken away by Christ. So the heavens are open, showing us that the path to salvation is open, and the dove descends, the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove descends, in order to show us that we've been reconciled to God. And all we, brothers and sisters, who have been baptized in the Orthodox Church, have seen heaven opened for us. 
and we should have kept our baptism pure. As St. John Chrysostom explains very well, we ought never have turned back after our baptism to our former ways. And he depicts this in an image for us. Let us keep watch over that noble birth we have received, he says. For had any king among those on earth, finding you poor and a beggar, made you suddenly his son, never would you have thought upon your cottage and your cottage's mean appointments. What does that mean? What is this image St. John Chrysostom using? In baptism, he says, it's if you're received into the house of the king from a poor and humble cottage that you might have been raised in. And he says, what person, when a king raises them up to a high level of estate, uh, spends all of his time once he's at this high level, thinking back on his former life in poverty, uh, living in a cottage with a dirt floor. No one, he says, does this. When we get raised up, our mind should come up to high things. And so he says, once we were baptized, our minds ought to have stayed on this high plane, but we haven't done this. We go back continually to the ways of the old man, closing those doors to heaven, which are open to us in holy baptism. Now, in addition, to tie things in further, uh, after the Divine Liturgy on the Feast of the Theophany, we'll celebrate the great blessing of waters. And this, too, in this sort of scheme of teaching, uh, calls our attention to very important things. The service of the blessing of waters, brothers and sisters, is a sort of call or an opportunity for us to reflect on what we have made of the gift of holy baptism, uh, the gifts we've received, rather, through holy baptism. This is why the service is at least in part reminiscent of the baptismal service. For example, the great litany that we use in the service of the blessing of waters is uh, identical to the great litany at the service of holy baptism. And also all the hymns and prayers, the very long prayers and hymns that we hear afterwards, will all make reference to baptism as well. Now, if having been moved to reflect on the condition of our own soul and what we've done with the baptismal gift we received, if this inspires or causes us to realize that we have soiled the garment we've been given, that we've indeed turned our attention back to the mean house from which we've come, as St. John Chrysostom says, that we have closed the door to heaven from our side, this should in no way be a cause for despair for us. For though we can never receive baptism again, there are still other waters which can again wash away the filth we've acquired and open to us the gifts of salvation, uh, which are still there and being offered to us continually, but we have, which we have buried deeply within us. Now, what waters are these brothers and sisters that can open these doors of heaven to us again? These are the waters of our tears. Tears of repentance become for us, brothers and sisters, a new Jordan River, a new new waters of baptism. As Metropolitan Augustino of Florida writes, if an angel comes down and collected all the tears shed in our world today, they would constitute a whole river. But not all tears have value, brothers and sisters. Only those tears have value which are shed on account of an offended conscience of true repentance. So the tears that we shed out of repentance, out of a recognition of our forfeiture, of our giving away of the gifts baptism has given us, these tears wash our souls clean again so that we can again become partakers of these wonderful gifts we've been offered. So, at least in brief then, that gives us a sense of the great significance of the events we're going to be celebrating over the coming few days. In these days, our salvation is revealed to us, and our Savior is revealed to us. We ought to keep this in mind. Also in these days, we'll come to know God better. We'll come to know that he's indeed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with absolute certainty. And in these days, the means of our salvation will be shown clearly to us. Amen. Now we've got a few minutes left over so we can have a little bit of a, a discussion if we want to. <laughs> Good evening, Father. Good evening.
if you if you maybe could speak to uh, sometimes a question arises as to the um, um, infant or you know very young child baptism versus adult baptism. You hear that in conversations, not so much within Orthodoxy, but you know within other sectors of mostly, I guess, Protestantism. But if you could maybe speak a bit to that and how um, you know why right. Why that somewhat of a controversy exists, I guess, within some circles, and you know yeah. why why Orthodoxy insists on infant baptism or very young child baptism as opposed to adult baptism. Well, I, I mean, part of it I think is tied directly to the the understanding of what baptism does uh, to a soul. Um, from the Orthodox perspective, uh, holy baptism actually is akin to a form of spiritual surgery. And that basically through the inheritance of our, our forefathers, when we're born in the usual manner, we inherit the, the ancestral sin or the ancestral curse. And what this is, is a, uh, it's the sort of shattering of the spiritual faculty within us uh, that can receive grace inwardly. Um, so prior to our baptism, God's grace shines down upon us, uh, trying to call us towards him. However, if the soul isn't baptized, it's incapable of receiving grace. The faculty within it that exists to receive grace is broken. That's what the, the ancestral curse is. We believe that uh, in every child born uh, in the normal manner naturally receives the ancestral curse, and this simply means that his, the spiritual faculty which receives grace in him is broken. It can't receive grace. Grace can't penetrate him. It can work on him from the outside, but it can't actually come into his heart and unite him to God. Um, and so baptism reforms that broken part of humanity, recreates it, um, because essentially what Christ does by being born of the Virgin and not being born in the usual manner, he bypasses the ancestral curse and restores in himself humanity to its initial condition in paradise. So his spiritual faculty, uh, the heart we might say, or the, the spiritual faculty in the soul that receives grace isn't broken. When we in baptism become uh, put on Christ, uh, our broken faculty is replaced with the restored faculty of Christ. And therefore, from that point on, we're capable of receiving grace inwardly, meaning that we're capable, capable of being united to God and capable of being saved. Um, so that in a whole bunch of words simply means that the way we view baptism is as a form of surgical spiritual operation. The way the Protestants view baptism particularly uh, is simply as an outward expression of the decision to follow a life of faith, we might say. So what happens is at a certain point in my life, I decide to make Christ my quote unquote personal Lord and Savior, and I give outward expression to that decision by submitting myself to baptism. And because it's the product of a conscious decision, it is something that can only be done when a person is old enough to make a conscious decision. It's simply a symbol of a conscious decision. Um, so in that sense, for them, uh, baptism can only be done uh, in a situation where a person is, is uh, old enough to, be, to make that conscious decision. For us, like I said, we don't believe that. We believe that it's a spiritual operation intended to reform the soul. So those are two very different uh, views of baptism. For us, uh, the person doesn't have to be conscious of what he's undergoing uh, in order to receive benefit from the surgery. Um, that, that's the basic sort of argument. Does that make, are we sort of together to that point? Okay. Uh, the, the issue, um, the, issue the, the other issue that sort of arises is uh, the context of scripture. And because a lot of the obvious examples of baptisms in scripture, for example, the, the, um, the eunuch uh, that gets baptized, uh, a lot of the examples that we have are examples of adults, the obvious examples in the scripture. When you simply pick up the New Testament and you read it straight through without the tradition sort of supporting it, um, I think one could easily mistakenly come to the conclusion that the only people baptized are adults. However, um, if you read the scriptures carefully and within the context of the tradition, what we start to see is that, for example, in Acts, it speaks of entire households being baptized. 
meaning not just the adults, but also the children. And we get this affirmed to us from the, the God-inspired interpreters of, tradition, of the tradition, which are the Holy Fathers. Um, so there are certainly uh, historical references to children having been baptized. But because the Protestants cut themselves off uh, from anything but the most obvious literal interpretation of the scriptures, they get trapped at a very basic level and can't see that, that in fact, the scriptures do speak of infant baptism. Does that also make sense? Yes. Okay. So those are, I think those are long both in the context of history uh, as a, a more than just amateur reading of scripture tells us, um, but also uh, they're wrong in terms of their theological outlook. There's, there's a difference there as well. And uh, I could add to that, and you can comment uh, just in the more, uh, uh, I guess, the more um, layman's terms, if I can say that. But uh, the church has condemned the improper practice of the early yeah. church where people would wait till their deathbed to be baptized, right? Yeah, and see that, and that also, though, I mean, I'm not sure, I don't know that much about Protestant, Protestant apologetics. Um, but even that practice wasn't based in the notion of baptism that they hold, that that uh, baptism is the expression of a conscious decision to uh, to embrace faith, so to speak. The reason that uh, that practice developed in the, the fourth century or third century uh, was had to do with the fact that parents believed their children had a high likelihood of falling into sin, and so that generally parents wouldn't baptize their children uh, because they wanted to sort of quote unquote, get the silliness out of their system. And then they would have them baptized a little bit later uh, in order to sort of help uh, preserve them uh, from, uh, you know, having some semblance of purity by the time of their death. Um, so they held our notion, the historical notion of baptism. The reason they delayed it was altogether different. It was just to say, get them through the silly period of their life, let them sin and get it all out of their system. Hopefully afterwards, they'll become more serious, they'll be baptized and they'll have a, a better chance of going to paradise. The church, of course, condemned that practice because they said it's a it's a very dangerous thing to leave someone unbaptized willingly. Because what happens if I mean we all know the death comes uh, suddenly in many cases. What happens if you delay baptism and this person uh, dies in the meantime? You you've you know, basically excluded them from paradise by virtue of your actions. Um, so the church has always condemned the practice of delaying baptism intentionally. And uh, also, I mean, waiting till you're on your deathbed, whether it's, you know, let's say you're 15 years old to 30 years old, uh, 70 years old, 90, um, you're, you're missing out on, this, on, on, on the holy mysteries, right? Sure. You're not baptized, including baptism, but I mean, the, 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 you know, holy communion. So how can you really develop spiritually, right? You know, uh, how, how can you receive the grace of God? How can you, you know, how can you experience that? Yeah, uh, like, I mean, you're not growing spiritually. You're not. You're not uh, progressing in the spiritual life. I mean, they were still. I mean, I think they, they were like, sort of practicing. I guess in their limited, um, yeah. uh, uh, within limits. But uh, you know, which is pretty much nothing because you're not be able to experience the holy mysteries. Um, but but again, yeah, you can't uh, fully develop spiritually. And I mean, at, on your deathbed, you get baptized and you receive holy communion. But uh, like you as a person, have you really uh, it, it developed spiritually, like to cleanse yourself in, in that sense of, you know, beyond just um, getting baptized and all that and just struggling, that struggle, I guess? Yeah, it certainly, it certainly creates a whole problem in that um, it creates a whole, a whole bunch of problems. It creates a whole bunch of problems. Again, the same problem, deathbed baptism, um, you can always die before it happens. I mean, that's one of the issues with putting it off is, okay, theoretically, you're going to wait. Everyone would like to think uh, they're going to have a little bit of time beforehand to sort of uh, plan things out, but it doesn't always work that way. Um, so there's that danger. Also the danger, like you said, maybe you develop a grave illness. Um, you know, you choose to be baptized but you, you have no practice of living the faith, so what do you do afterwards with it if, if you sort of recover? Um, all those kinds of things. It, it raises a whole bunch of serious issues um, in that regard.
so yeah you're, you're right to point those things out and also um we just if you can just comment we see like some examples in the lives of the saints or the, the church fathers like saint john chrysostom um like where they would get baptized like around 30 years old when you know they would reach what the church you know considers what they consider the fathers themselves to be like you've reached maturity now right you're you're a grown up you're past all that now uh like what was were they trying to maybe like imitate christ because like, I, th I think if i i think he was baptized around 30 years old and began his public ministry right yeah there's there is that element of it sometimes um but the underlying notion behind that even in those cases was the one we just described about um hoping that by that time they had put the silliness behind them um so saint john chrysostom uh also saint ambrose of milan wasn't baptized uh, until later in life and those were both cases of parents that uh, that delayed baptism for that reason so part of it some in some cases i have heard like some of them do add this notion of uh you know coming to the fullest and the fullness of stature and reaching 30 years of age um, but the underlying presupposition is this notion that you might have behaved sillily earlier. I'm going to say this in Greek. Aerobaptisma, um, is it the same as being baptized in a colibitra? Sorry, what was that? Aerobaptisma, you know, when you go around the. Yeah, aerial baptism. Yeah. Aerial baptism? Yeah. No. Aerial baptism um, is legitimate in case of emergency. It's commanded by the saints. Uh, it's absolutely something that, that is, is said to be done. St. Cosma, for example, is one of the saints who says this. You know, he says, if you, your child is born, your child is sick, call the priest. If the priest can't get there, then this is what the layman should do. You know, uh, pick the baby up in the air. If you have a little bit of water, use it. If you don't, pick the, lay, uh, the baby up in the air three times in the name of the Trinity. Um, so it's commended uh, and obviously has some form of effect on the soul because the fathers commend it. Um, however, if the child survives, and this is the case of any emergency baptism, even if a baptism is done in, in an emergency and part of it is done properly by a priest, whatever isn't done has to then be done when the child is brought to church. So if there are elements of the baptismal service, for example, that because of a grave illness, uh, if it has to be done quickly and parts of the, the, the baptism are skipped, uh, whatever isn't done has to be done in church afterwards. So it's the same with aerial baptism. Whatever isn't done there has to be, has to be brought into the church and has to be corrected. If the child survives. Whatever God, what God does with it, I mean, because it's commended by our tradition, we know that God views it, uh, views it well um, if a child dies in that condition. However, if the child lives, the child has to be brought to church and things have to be done, have to be done properly. Um, your blessings, Father. Um, I, now that uh, baptism was brought up, uh, can you hear me, Father? Yeah. Okay. Um, there's something else I wanted to bring up. It's a rather controversial issue relating to baptism within the church. It has to do with economia via dealing with non-Orthodox, the reception of non-Orthodox members into the church. And uh, I know Father Peter Hears has sent me many much material on this. And he even sent me an article in Greek by Father Anastasios Gotsobulos, which I translated the whole thing in English, he asked me to. Um, and they go extensively into this. Um, St. Athanasius the Great talks about the Arian baptisms, and he says something like, their, bap their baptism is not able to cleanse them of the ancestral sin, it pollutes them or something like that. St. Cyril of Jerusalem okay, talks about this. Question. Anyways, there's all, th th my question is, um, on the reception of converts, there's a lot of different ways of receiving them. And my understanding is that all the Holy Fathers said that when they're receiving them, they're not actually recognizing their mysteries. They're just doing it out of economia, and it's not actually cleansing them. Other priests have turned around and said, oh, when we do confession of faith, receive them by confession of faith, or chrismation, 
because they have a Holy Trinity baptism that we're somehow correcting it or I, I don't know how they explain it or, you know, but my, my question is, um, you know, if we're receiving them and we're not doing the baptism, we're not rebaptizing them, which is happening yes. in these quantities, are they really being cleansed of the ancestral sin if they're not being baptized? No. You know? Yeah. The baptism, the, the view that's existed throughout the history of the church is that, um, I mean, his father Peter's covered this extensively in his book, and I, I don't think anyone puts it any better than he does. Um, uh, yeah, what yeah. he does there is the reflection of, of what a lot of I mean, he says, as independent. My understanding, he says no. My understanding is he agrees with what you just said, you know. Yeah, no, he, he, what Father Peter wrote there is the exact expression of what a number of us did as independent studies throughout our lives and sort of came to the same conclusions. Uh, Father Peter has just sort of synopsized and put it, put it extremely well. Um, the notion is that sort of historically, um, I mean, if we look at St. Basil, uh, the way the, the saints that speak about baptism speak about it, the understanding is that no, there is, there is no baptism outside uh, the Orthodox Church. Now, what, what happens in some cases, uh, beginning with, particularly with Augustine, uh, they begin to develop the notion that uh, the external form of baptism uh, can exist and can be applied in, in heresy and schism. Um, however, that whatever is done there, providing it's done precisely correctly, meaning it's done in a schism that, that has maintained orthodox practice with respect to baptism, baptismal method, and all of those things, um, as long as everything is done absolutely corrected, the dead form of that baptism can be energized when the person is brought into the, into the church. So the notion would be in those cases, we would never say that those people have a valid baptism prior to their coming to the church. Um, even though they weren't baptized when they were received, uh, the dead form was given life and fullness once, it, once the person was united to the church. Like I said, the only cases that those are able to be applied in are cases of, of basically schism, where the baptismal practice has been the same. So, for example, they teach uh, immersion, triune immersion. Uh, they baptize, uh, you know, the faith has remained the same. Basically, a schism is a situation where there's been some political fracture in the community, but the faith has been, uh, faith retained is, is identical to orthodoxy. Um, so, no, there's... The example, the answer is no, there, no one has ever taught uh, that baptism exists outside the church in any form. I mean, the reason I bring this up is because, unfortunately, with some jurisdictions, not all, obviously there's certain priests that disregard those jurisdictions from the hierarchs and maintain the tradition, um, you know, as, as a result of ecumenism and certain things that are going on. Um, this is a uh, turned into a huge argument between many priests arguing with each other and hierarchs arguing with each other and even lay people arguing with priests or lay people arguing with each other uh, to the point where some priests will say, well, as long as it's in the Holy Trinity, it doesn't even matter if it's even done triple yeah. immersion and it goes on and on. And there's the synods in Russia uh, that supposedly supported this and, but, and there's a Constantinople Synod, which overturned those Russian synods, and I don't know. Um, so um, I don't know if you can. I mean, I mean, what do we do when when several priests and bishops are not all saying the same thing? You know, like there's. Well, most of us, most of us are baptized, so I don't expect for a lot of us there's an immediate problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> Yeah. I, I mean, it's not, it's not a, you know, pastorally, it's a concern, obviously, to me. Um, but for most of, most of us, I don't think it's an issue. I mean, I, I heard one priest, he, up in the West, and I'm not going to mention his name, he, he, he did a whole YouTube homily on it, and he was basically making fun of uh, the triple immersion baptism and saying, well, what is this, the Achilles heel or something like that, and saying that just... 
you hear funny things. It doesn't matter. We what our job our job is to live the gospel as best we can and to uh, to make sure what we're doing is right before God in order to you know prevent ourselves from falling into sin. And that's that's what our duty is. Uh, well, if we know it's better, uh, you know, a friend of mine used to say he was complaining. He went to his spiritual father, sort of complaining about uh, lots of different practices that were anomalies within the Orthodox Church, and di rightly diagnosing that this was not coming from a good place within within his spiritual child. The, the spiritual father just said, "Well, just don't you do." That's the extent of your responsibility at this stage of the game. Just don't you do. You try to figure out what's right, and you stick to that course. Let you know to a certain extent the there's people who have to be involved directly in some of this stuff, and for a lot of us, we don't have to be as directly involved in it. And so, I think in in some of those cases where we don't have to be, um, and our involvement isn't necessarily going to produce anything productive, we have to we have to uh, question what our role is in those situations. And I, I guess my final question is very short is um you know in terms of like going to certain priests and listening to homilies by them that are openly preaching things that our church actually doesn't believe is it even safe to even go and listen to these people why would you go you know you know you know you got you live in a place where there's lots of churches why would you go yeah go where it fits yeah, Father, and this this really, like you said it, like this just all goes back to having a good spiritual father. Thank you. Um, no, no matter no matter what, like ZC was saying, no matter what uh, you come across, uh, and it's, it can get ugly, right? Um, it's just having that good spiritual father, um, yeah. and uh, and listening to him, and uh, and like you said, he'll say just you don't do, or or in this extreme example, uh, you know, you just don't attend those. You don't have to attend those homilies. You know, you, 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 you go to church and you participate in the holy mysteries and and then and, and really just listen to your spiritual father from there, like uh, what, how far to get yourself involved, you know. So it, That's really it. just goes back to that. St. Sinclaquiqui, who we'll, we'll uh, celebrate tomorrow, in one of her teachings says, look, there's three categories of humans. There's three categories of people. The one are the people who deliberately incline towards evil who just choose to do evil things. They like to be bad. When they're around bad people, they get even worse. In the middle, there's a group of people that have some passionate inclinations, but they're struggling to be better. On the other extreme, you have people that are the saints. They're extremely virtuous. And in her analysis of these three categories of people, she focuses particularly on the last two. She says the middle group have to be very careful to stay away from the bad places because they're trying to get better, but they're not strong enough to help the people that are in the lower category. They, their attention really has to be on their own spiritual life. The people in the higher category that are established in good works and are proven true in their love for Christ by their life, those people can actually go back and help the people on the lower end of the spectrum. And so sometimes we have to really sort of, I think, be honest with ourselves, look at those three categories of people and say, where am I? Most of the time, I think, if we're honest, I mean, I don't know, there, there may be saints in the room, so I don't, wish to, I don't wish to say anything against the saints. But most of us, I think, find ourselves in the middle category. And therefore, the strongest part of our duty at this stage is to isolate ourselves from bad influences. And that's, that's really what we need to do. Some of us, by virtue of a particular calling, may have to be involved in some of these situations. But generally, our duty is going to be towards keeping ourselves free of, of, of uh, evil situations and bad situations. And that's what's going to be helping our spiritual development and hopefully getting ourselves into that third category before we propose so that maybe then we're actually in a position to help someone else. Thank you very much, uh, Father, again, for uh, this lovely homily and uh, taking our questions. Um, uh, that's it, I guess. Uh, so um, if you don't have anything else to add, I guess we can end with a brief prayer. That's it for me.
O Christ, the true light which illumines and sanctifies every man who comes into the world, let the light of thy countenance be signed upon us, that in it we may behold the light unapproachable. Guide our footsteps aright to the keeping of thy commandments through the intercessions of thine all-immaculate mother and of all the saints. Amen. I mean, thank you very much again, Father. Have a good night. God bless you.